Well, it is so good to see you today. I want to take a moment and welcome our campuses. Um, those of you who are watching from some other location, I know there are a lot of you who are uh, snowbirds and you're in some place a little less like the gates of hell today. And uh, we're jealous and a little bitter, but we welcome you in. Anyways, come on, put your hands together for your family. Welcome them in from every place today. So excited. If you have your Bibles today, I want you to get them out and go with me to the book of John. John chapter 2 is where we're going to spend today. While you're turning there, um, I do want to remind you that tomorrow morning begins our KidCon, which is sort of our version, amen, our sort of version of vacation Bible school for our children ages, I believe, 5 through 12. And so uh, I want to encourage you, if you've not yet signed your kid up, I believe there's still some spot and location at every campus we're doing this. Um, this is a great opportunity to get your kids um, you know, out of the house and having a great time learning about Jesus, and, and it's just an amazing time. Make it a discipline or practice to get your kids in church around believers. Come on, somebody, because I'm telling you, the world is, is, is beating them senseless in the world, and they need a little time with believers and faith to be encouraged and life spoken over them, and that happens in this place. And I um, also want to let you know there is a a small cost attached to it, but um, as, as always, um, if finances are an issue for you, and, and we never want you to say no to ministry because of money, and so uh, we have, just based off the generosity of great folks of Zion City, some scholarships um, that are available, so if you'd like to sign your kid up, there's some partial scholarships available um, to where your kids can come and be a part, and they will bless you, and you will bless them. I just, I believe they'll come back home better kids, Amen. And, uh, and, and so I just think it's a great opportunity, uh, KidCon starting tomorrow, be in prayer for them. And then Wednesday night, uh, we actually wrap up KidCon. We give them the Wednesday night service. So if you're coming for prayer, it's a little different kind of night. We are going to do some praying with our kids. It's going to give me an incredible night, but uh, it's a lot of fun as they wrap up this season and uh, we're excited about this week. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn to the John chapter 2. And uh, we're going to begin in, in uh, actually, we're going to spend our time in, in chapter 2, but I want to begin with a verse that is a, a foundational verse for this series. We're in a series on John. I believe it is a summer of miracles. Somebody say summer of miracles. And uh, we're not only just preaching about miracles, but we're believing for, contending for, and experiencing miracles um, throughout the entire, how many believe God still does miracles? Come on. He is a supernatural God who is not limited by your natural. I am thankful that he is supernatural. So if you have your Bibles, John chapter 20, I'm going to read this. You can stay in two. It'll be on the screens. It says this, but these are written. Somebody say these. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. John tells us that he wrote this book um, with the intent and design to help those who are struggling in their belief, to help those who are unbelievers, um, perhaps to help those to help those who are new in their belief, um, but even for those of us who believe, to help us believe even more, to deepen our beliefs, to securely fasten our belief in the fact that Jesus is the Christ. As I said before, Christ is not Jesus' last name. It is a designation as the Messiah of the universe. Come on, somebody. And so he says this, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So John tells us, I, I wrote this gospel, this gospel for you to be able to grow in your belief. I love the book of John because it is a, a bit of a renegade gospel in that the rest of the gospels, what we know of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, are, are called the synoptic gospels. What that means is, is they have the sort of same scope and approach to how they approached detailing the gospels, the ministry, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. John, though, is a little different because John doesn't start with genealogies, earthly genealogies of Jesus, or, or he doesn't start with a narrative of the scene of the manger. He really doesn't go through the adolescent years of Jesus, which we really don't have much about. And, 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 but really, John begins at the baptism of Jesus. 
He begins at the beginning place of Jesus' ministry. This is why it's different. Because he focuses primarily on the calling of his disciples, the, the, the miracles there are in the book uh, of John chapter 2 through chapter 12. It has become um, known as the book of signs. Somebody say signs. And it's a book of signs that point us towards this belief. And then it sort of transitions to Jesus with his disciples in the last sort of hours. Then Jesus' death, his resurrection. And then some final, and I tell you, I will not preach through all of John just simply because of time. But I will tell you this, I would encourage you to read through the book of John this summer. Um, There is some incredible, incredible, incredibly rich um, words of Jesus as it relates to the person of the Holy Spirit. John 14, John 16, he talks about unity in John 17. He talks about believers and the kingdom of God. It it is a life changing. I tell new believers or people who are new to faith, listen, when you begin reading your Bible, start with the book of John, because if you want to know what it is to be a Christian, you need to learn what Christ is like. Come on, somebody. And so I encourage you to do that. But today we're going to begin in really digging into what John calls the book of signs. It is a chronicle of the awe-inspiring miracles, and each one of them being a testament to Jesus' divine nature and his role as Messiah. But even more than that, it's not that who just Jesus is, but it's what he came to do, that he came to transform your life. He, oh, that, was, that was weak. He came, as about three of you got caught off guard. I get it. I'll give you another chance. He came to transform your life. Thank you. He came, and what John records for us are signs. Now, I got to tell you, um, I have this interesting, I was out yesterday morning, I uh, got a little bit of a late start, I wasn't out till probably about, about six or so, and I decided I was going to go on a quick 13-mile run. Anybody with me, right? And uh, just for funsies, right? And so I got up yesterday and I took off. Well, the longer I went, um, the inferno called Arizona kicked in. You all know it's hot out there, right? But there's something interesting that has happened as I have, as I have, you know, gone through this process of running over the last couple of years. I have had so many uh, interesting interactions with vehicles and drivers. Come on, somebody. Any of you who ride a bike or run or uh, spend any amount of time uh, outside of a car where cars are, you, you know, you, you pray in tongues a lot if you're like me, right? Because one thing I've noticed about people, especially with the advent of phones, people just simply don't pay attention anymore. Amen. And uh, I've, I've had a few uh, challenging interactions with folks. I didn't cuss. I wanted to, but I didn't cuss. Because sure enough, I'm going to cuss at somebody and they'd be like, Pastor, you know what I'm saying? And so, <laughs> so y'all are keeping me saved. I appreciate that. And, and as I was, I was out there, though, I started having this thought. I was thinking about... Uh, the implications of one of the signs that have become so common. That's one of the dangers of signs is you can get used to them. You, you, can, you can start taking them for granted. Uh, for instance, you know, you drive down the highway and the highway has always been a particular speed limit and then all of a sudden they change everything with construction and now it's no longer what you... And just, it's, it's just because we've gotten so familiar with the sign, we, we no longer are aware of it. I think sometimes with believers that they read the scriptures, we can become so aware of Jesus' signs and miracles. We're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's just what he does. And we lose the full implication of what Jesus is trying to tell us and show us through these miraculous signs. For, for some people, though, you know, when they see, let's say, a speed limit sign, when they see that sign, it, it's a very clear indication of what is expected. Or it's a, it's a clear communication of what the limit of the miles per hour is in a given particular place. For others, though, it's sort of more of a suggestion. Just try to get close, if you, if you wouldn't mind. Some of you are 10 miles under. Oh, you're the ones I pray for deeply. And so... Some of you are, are, are 10 miles over. You're like me. You live in an age of grace. Come on, anybody believe in grace? And there's a lot of law enforcement in this room, and you just need to love your pastor and give him grace. But, but, but there are many times, I, th- I thought about the sign as I was running. I thought, you know, sometimes, sometimes we just kind of view it as a, a more of a suggestion than it is a real clear communication. Sometimes I think people read the scriptures and like, well, you know, it's just kind of a, one of those stories. There are some people when they see the very same sign, they think it doesn't apply to me and it doesn't matter. 
They completely disregard the sign. What's so interesting about Jesus' signs in these next number of weeks is what you're going to find is with every sign, there were an element of people who responded and believed. There were an element of people who disregarded and got angry. The signs will create um, a hunger, but it will also create a controversy depending on who the person is who's receiving it. Last week, I talked about belief, and I talked about the fact that we were given this to believe. And, and it was interesting because we always have the, the QR code where you can ask questions about the message, and we go in on Monday morning, and we record um, the, the questions. I will tell you this. I, I don't typically respond to statements because statements aren't questions. You follow me? I'm not here to pick a fight. I'm here actually to help people grow in the word of God and develop a depth in their understanding. But, but it's interesting because, because it did the exact thing that signs do. On one hand, there were people who were stirred and they were, they were deepening their faith and hunger. And then there were other people that just created controversy for them. And they just sort of lashed out in a sort of anger and defiance. And the reality is that's nothing new. That's always what's happened when Jesus performs signs and miracles. So it's nothing new. But there are some who will just disregard the signs and there are some who will respond to them. But signs are given to us for a reason. Amen. Except for these signs. I thought we'd have a little bit of fun today. Y'all want to see some signs that I thought were fun. It's always to have fun in church, right? It's your tax dollars at work right there. And so, right, th- this one's sort of self-explanatory. I love the next one. This is, a, this is a good one. Touching wires causes instant death and a $200 fine. <laughs> this, is, this is somebody trying, the, the Newcastle Tramway Authority is trying to prove a point. Not only will you die, we're going to fine you after you're dead as well. Um, now, there's been a challenge with this one. Soccer, not always Uh, Not allowed. Soccer may be played in the archery range. (laughs) Now, I think this is actually brilliant because there are some, um, like myself, and don't get mad, don't get offended because you just gave all your offense to Jesus a few moments ago, but but there are some who find soccer to be somewhat boring. Now, uh, uh, me and one guy. (laughs) Me and that guy, right? Okay. And don't get offended. I know that you grew up on soccer and you think it's great. And I'm like, I just, I can't like, you know, it's all that work for one point. I don't get it. Like at least make it 10 points, at least make it exciting. But here's the thing. I thought, you know, that that's actually a brilliant solution because what would make soccer very interesting is if you played it on an archery range, that would actually add <laughs> just ahead of my time. And, and this one, I don't think really needs a lot of explanation, but The signs that John writes about are are unlike these signs because they are intended for the purpose to help us to believe. John chapter 2 and verse 1, if you're there, let's read this together. You read quietly. If you don't have a Bible, you have a couple of options. We'll have them on the screen or the person next to you with a Bible is obviously a Christian and they would share. Um, Chapter 2, verse 1, on the third day. Now, I got to tell you this. I'm just going to highlight a few things, not going into them right now. But I'm just going to tell you, take note of some things, because I think it will help you as we come back to them. What I want you to understand is that nothing in Scripture is accidental, coincidental, or unnecessary. Everything that is breathed by the Holy Spirit carries with it a purpose and an intent and design. Um, The Holy Spirit and and the writers, those who penned it, are not like me. You know, when I have a, a, a word quota I have to fill for a paper, I'm just adding all kinds of stuff to get to 10,000 words. Are y'all with me? The Holy Spirit's not like that because the Holy Spirit uses every word and every sort of instance. Now, we may not understand it, and this today, what I'm going to attempt to do today is to deepen your faith, because faith comes by hearing the word, to deepen your faith. I'm not trying to give you little incidental facts and ideas. I'm trying to help you understand how the Holy Spirit is weaving together a story that applies to you sitting here today. And so there's a few things I'll highlight and we'll come back to. Um, Chapter two and verse one, on the third day, take note. Take note of that. On the third day, why why would that be there? On the third day. Now, it's easy for us to go, well, the third day, that's all throughout Christianity. And it is. Um, And I think John is alluding to something, but there's even more, I think, that John is trying to, to say with us and giving this a date and time. There was a wedding. Interesting, there's a wedding. 
in Cana of Galilee. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting, there were literally two. This is the first sign, the first miracle Jesus ever performed. And there's another miracle in Cana. Some people believe that Nathaniel, it's, they don't believe it, it's actually in scripture, that Nathaniel was from Cana of Galilee. So one of his disciples was actually from this area. The thought is, is that why did Jesus get invited to a wedding was more than likely Nathaniel may have had some connection with this family and thus brings about the story for today. But there was a Cana, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. It's interesting, the second, the first, the, the first miracle that Jesus performs is at a Jewish wedding. The second miracle that Jesus performs is to the Gentile, to a leader's, a, a, a civil leader's, uh, healing a civil leader's son. Now, why is this important? He's actually talking to a Samaritan woman and then heals a, a Gentile leader's son. And I think it's an indication to us of exactly what he says in scripture, to the Jew first and then to the Greek, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. There was a, an order in which Jesus was doing things. It wasn't just random. And so he began by establishing himself, um, as you're going to find out, as the Messiah to the Jew first. And then he comes out of that and performs another miracle in the same city and invites all of the Gentiles into the same sort of relationship that he has in terms of with the Jew. It's important. Just take note. Jesus was also invited. It says this, the, the mother of Jesus was there and Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine ran out, The mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, (laughs) Uh, (laughs) somebody like Jesus, you're going to die early. Okay, anyways, but it's not a disrespectful statement. I'll, I'll show it to you in a minute. He says, woman, what does that have to do with me? That's none of my business is what he's saying. It's, I'm not the, I'm not the guy in charge of the party. I'm a guest, right? It's, it's important. Pay attention. He says, uh, what does it have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. John uses that phrase, my hour, several times throughout this gospel. His mother said to the servants, I love this, do whatever he tells you. It's almost like she just ignored Jesus, isn't it? It's almost like she just kicked in like your mama did and just like took hold of the situation and be like, whatever he says, just do it. It's important. Take note. Now, there were six stone water jars there. It's interesting. Six stone, not clay, but stone water jars there for the Jewish rite of uh, of purification. Each one holding 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Jesus is now engaged. He says, "Fill fill the jars with water. Now watch this. And they filled them to the brim. Take note. And he said to them, now draw out and take it to the master of the feast. The master of the feast would have been simply the, 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 the director, the person in charge of the meal, the, in charge of the wine and that sort of things. Take them to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know from where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, j- just to pause for a moment, think about the, the, the trepidation and anxiety these servants would have. They just poured water. They just dipped out. Maybe it still looked white, like water. I don't know if it ever looked like wine, but it sure tasted like wine. It could have been transformed to look like, I don't know, but the reality is it, was, it became wine. That's what we know. Could you imagine the intrepidation? They would have to dip in and be like, oh, whatever you say, Jesus, I'm taking it, but this is not going to end well, right? And so they knew where it came from. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, um, then the poor wine. But you've kept the good wine until now. Interesting. This is the first of his signs. Jesus did in Canaan and Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed him. It's always been interesting to me to think about the very first miracle of Jesus. I mean, if you were going to sort of show up on the stage and, 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 and claim that you're the Messiah, claim that you're the one who's come to take away the sins of the world, if you're going to show up and do this, I would think you would do something that would be so demonstrative, amazingly supernatural in nature. I'm not saying this wasn't supernatural, but, 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 
really, when you look at the way Jesus transformed this water into wine, there were no theatrics. There were, there were no, you know, calling down from heaven. There were no angels and glory. But yet the Bible tells us that they had seen, they had seen the glory of God. They saw the glory show up. But yet it just seems like Jesus said, hey, fill the water pots, take it to the guy. Very natural in its approach. And so there are many times I think about this thing, man, Jesus, why wouldn't you start out by, by, by raising someone from the dead? Or why wouldn't you open the blinded eyes? Or why wouldn't you cast the demon out? Why would, and while we have in scripture rest Record of all of those things, he simply begins and it poses this question. Why would Jesus choose to perform his first miracle by providing alcohol at a party? Is anybody with me? Now, there's a reason, and it may not be what you, some of you are like, well, Jesus just likes to party. No, 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 that's not exactly the reason, though I think he was very much a part of the celebration. But for the religious folks in the room, I'm sure that probably bothers you a little bit. Do you understand that there have been entire books written on the the idea that the wine that Jesus created wasn't actually alcoholic? And um, people take time to write books on this stuff. I'm like, man, that, you got time, brother. Like you got plenty of time on your hands. And while I'm not here to argue the alcoholic content of the wine, and I will tell you this, it, it was vastly different than it is today. Our, our technology, the distillation processes that we go through make for a far stronger alcoholic drink than by, by literally they would say it would be 1%, 2% alcohol through a natural fermentation. That's not necessarily my point though. The bottom line is this, the indication of the, of the, of the, bride, of the, of the uh, master of ceremonies was simply this. Normally people bring out the good wine, get everybody a little bit uh, relaxed, shall we say, and then they bring out the, the, the garbage stuff. They bring out the bottom shelf stuff. They, and yet, here's the challenge we have. Why would Jesus begin his entire ministry career by providing alcohol at a party? It's interesting, isn't it? But I believe there are reasons specifically why Jesus did what he did. Let me give you a few thoughts. Number one, if you read through the narrative of scripture, you'll see that we are very near the Passover and for the for the Jewish uh, individual, Passover is the highest of holidays, one of the highest of holidays throughout the, the, the year. It is the remembrance of the children of Israel delivered from, from Egypt, brought into their promised land. God creating a people, shaping a people, leading a people into their promised land. And if you will think back to the, the Passover that began, it, it ended with, the, with the, the, the blood being spread upon the posts and the, and the doorposts. But it began, Moses' very first miracle was to transform what? Water into blood. See, I don't think there's anything lost on that because you think about this, what did, what did Moses deliver? Moses was the one that God used to deliver the law, the law, the stone law. It's interesting, stone pots. There's a, there's a lot of uh, particulars happening in the narrative of this story in, in that Moses is the one who brought the law. And later on in scripture, we find out scripture tells us that the law kills right? The law brings death, thus the blood in the water, but the spirit gives life. That the law of Christ is different than the law of Moses. And so the very first miracle of of Moses was that he turned water into blood. The very first miracle of Jesus was that he turned water not into blood, signifying death, but water being turned into wine that would signify life and celebration and abundance and joy. Are y'all hearing me? And so there's this picture that Jesus is greater than Moses. And for the, the Jewish individual, this would have been a massive moment of challenge. And so Jesus is established as the one who, who, would, who would break the curse of the, the law of sin that brings death, and he would bring life instead of death. But also it's interesting if you were to study your Bible, and again, these 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 followers of Judaism, they would have understood the messianic prophecies of the abundance of wine that would show up with the Messiah. Listen to it. Amos chapter nine and verse 11 says, in that day, I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair his breaches. What's he saying? He's talking about King David, of which there were prophecies that the Messiah would come from the line of David. So David was king and it has been broken down. Are y'all following this? 
David is no longer king. They are serving under the Roman oppression, literally years and years later, and it has all sort of fallen apart. But God promises that he will, he will restore that and he will bring back the Messiah who he says this, he will rebuild it as in the days of old. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountains, watch this, shall drip sweet wine. One of the messianic prophecies was that there would be this abundance of wine that showed up with the Messiah, but not just an abundance of wine, but an abundance of food. He said, and the hills shall flow with it. Isaiah 25 verse six says this, on the mountain of the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a rich, a rich, a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich full food, full of marrow and aged wine, well refined. So there are prophecies that when the Messiah shows up, there will be this abundance of wine that shows up. It's also interesting that water uh, in the Torah and the religious leaders of the day was often likened unto water. This water that was held in a stone container, much like the the stone container of the law of Moses, the 10 commandments, and and it, it it was likened unto water, and yet the Holy Spirit in scripture is likened unto wine. Interesting. What happened at the day of Pentecost when people were filled with the Holy Spirit, people assumed they were drunk on wine. Are y'all hearing me? And so, and so what I love about the story is not that Jesus smashes and destroys the, the, the purification vessels. He doesn't get rid of them. He fills them with the Holy Spirit. Are y'all hearing me? That he doesn't just get rid of the law. No, no, no. He says, I've come to fulfill the law. I've come to bring you into grace. I've come to give you the the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? That you would love God, that you would love others, that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. He redeems this stone container and fills it with his presence and gives us life instead of death. Amen, somebody. You see, I love this because John 1, 33, listen to what John says about Jesus. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me, this is John the baptized, to baptize with water, repentance. Are y'all following me? With water, he said to me, on, on, he on whom you've seen the spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is signifying in this moment a a, a cosmic shift. He has come to fulfill the, the Old Testament covenant, but he's come to bring the Holy Spirit to his believers and to bring joy and life, life abundant and celebration that comes from the Holy Spirit. And finally, I would say, why did Jesus choose the, the providing of alcohol at a party is his first miracle. Jesus, in this, this one instance, discards the man-made rituals and traditions of the day, instead choosing to meet human needs. You see, for the, the bridegroom, for the family of the bridegroom to run out of wine wouldn't have just been a, a, a faux pas of like, let's just run down to the local convenience store and grab ourselves a, a box of goodness. You know what I'm saying? Like it wouldn't have been that way. There, there would be no opportunity to restore this. And, and weddings weren't just for three or four hours. Weddings were week long events where people would travel in. And when they traveled in, the, the, the laws of hospitality would have been such that you provided their food, you provided lodging, that you provided wine for them. You were, you were there. It was, it was a matter of your honor that you would provide all of this for those who traveled to celebrate, celebrate with you this wedding feast. And so understand, for the bridegroom and for the family, if they had run out of something, it would have been a, an, an, an instance of shame that would have been on their family, not just for the moment, but for years, people would have talked about the shame of that family and how they ran out and they were shameful people who didn't provide for those who came to celebrate. In this moment, Jesus understands the cultural dynamics and he chooses instead of of, of abiding by a ritual tradition. What, What do I mean? These are pots that are set up solely for the purpose of, of purification. 
probably not like the, the mikvah or, the, or the, the, the baptism, if you will, but really more so for the washing of hands or for the washing of utensils um, before eating or, or perhaps something that had become unclean. This water would have been used to, to purify them according to the rituals of the day. And Jesus disregards all of that and uses them as a, as a container from which to serve the Holy Spirit, which is exactly what Jesus was. He came as a vessel to serve the Holy Spirit to the believers, those who would follow him, he's going to pour out of his vessel, pour out of himself the spirit of God that will give you life and transform you and change you from the inside out. Amen. If you were to continue reading in in John, you'll see one of the next things that John does is he places the temple cleansing right after this event. It's purposeful. He actually, some believe, well, you moved it up, and he didn't really move it up. I think it's there for the purpose of only reinforcing that Jesus came to break the the man-made traditions of the day and reinforce the idea of helping people connect with God. The greatest need that people had was to connect with God. And so when he came into the temple, what did he do? He flipped over the tables. He drove out the money changers. He he didn't do this because a lot of people think this is, well, he was opposed to them selling stuff. No, no, no. They were blocking people's People's connection to, they couldn't, the Gentile couldn't get to God because it was filled with these merchants and some who were, who were dishonest even in what they were doing. They were blocking people's connection to God. And so Jesus sees the need of people again. And instead of choosing the rituals of the day, it seems as though he rejects them to serve mankind. Amen. If we were to read this and, and, and consider this, we see again and again, Jesus is establishing himself exactly as John says, signs that he is the Christ. And so the question is, as we read this, how do we, how do we apply this, this sign to our lives today? How do we take this? We're, we're not necessarily Jewish, though some might be. We're, we're not living in the land of Cana. And while the Bible was written to people, it was written for us as well. And so how do we walk through the scripture and apply it to us sitting here in 2024. And, and so I wanna walk through this with that lens today. Number one, I'd say this. Um, it begins in John chapter two and verse three. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Many people believe that Mary being a woman would have had access, a, a greater level of access to what was happening in the preparation of food. And that Jesus, because he was a man, would have probably been in a different part of the house. And so she is relating some insider information to Jesus and saying, hey, son, I need to let you know, things are not as good as they appear on the outside. Um, We're about to run out of wine. But here's my question to you, and and here's the statement I make. Number one, how do we apply it? Every transformation uh, begins with an awareness of what is lacking. Here's my question. Do you know what you don't know? Do, do, you, do you, are you aware, my friend, of what is lacking in your life today? Now, it, please pause for a second, because I think we go to very quick things. We go, well, I'm, I'm, you know, single people sometimes, not everybody, but sometimes single people, well, like what's missing is my spouse. If I had that, then I wouldn't be missing anything. Oh, grasshopper. Right? There's some people who say, what I'm missing is money, pastor. I'm broke. I'm poor. I don't, I don't have any money. I'm, I have more bills than, than the money at the end of the month, and I'm struggling because here's what I need. I, I need the money not to run out. My money runs out before my bills do. And, and it, very quickly, if I were to ask you, you know what you're lacking? Someone would say, well, I'm lacking, you know, relationship. I'm lonely. I'm, I, I'm, I'm depressed. I'm disconnected. Uh, there are a number of things that you could say today that you were lacking. And, and here's what I would say to you. When you really begin to understand what you're missing is when transformation has an opportunity to happen. Mary looks at Jesus and said, hey, we, there's a problem. Life, it looks great. See, this is the problem. We are so great at, at putting up the facade and the appearance on the outside as though everything is great. How are you doing? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored, brother. Right. We are so great at putting up the, the walls and the facade because we don't want anybody else to know what's lacking. But the reality is, the question is, do you know what's lacking? 
Because transformation begins when we understand what is missing. What, what happens in your life, friend? Listen, and you may say, well, no, I don't have anything lacking. Well, I have another question then. What happens when what you're counting on fails? When you thought an amassed amount of money in your bank account would be the thing, and perhaps you get there, and it's not the thing. What happens to those who say, well, I'm, I'm lacking a spouse, and then you get a spouse, and you're like, this ain't it. I thought this was it, but this thing's defective. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I just have these thoughts, like, you ought to buy your bride from Costco, because you could take it back. No, I'm just kidding, but right. That's the problem. Because we think that, well, you know, it's, it didn't work, so I got the wrong one. And so we start thinking in these terms, what happens with what you're counting on? I just need more education. I just need, I just need to be smarter. I need more gifted. I need this. I need that. I need, I, I need I, whatever it is that you think it is that you're lacking. What happens when what you're counting on, when it fails? You see, this entire family, the bridegroom, the master of ceremony, they were counting on the fact that what they had was sustain him, and it ran woefully short. Where do you find yourself when it runs short? of your expectation. There are many of us who've been there. I, I've been there. I thought that would have been the thing and it wasn't the thing. But it's even deeper than that really for this family because it wasn't just a matter of, of losing out on, on, on a meal or, or a drink. The, the shame culture, the honor culture of the day would have put such shame on them that, that they, for years would have been the shame of their community, of their friends, their family, because what they had ran short. And can I tell you what often happens when what we think it is, isn't it, suddenly shame and condemnation and guilt begins to fill us and overwhelm us. And we've feel shameful. Can I tell you something? What I love about Jesus, we say all the time around here, we don't do shame. Well, I'm so glad Jesus doesn't do shame either because he steps in and he removes the possibility of shame in this family. And instead he brings the abundance that brings joy and celebration. They never even knew what happened because Jesus had stepped in and righted that which was wrong and brought abundance to them and brought joy to them and brought life, sustained the life in their wedding ceremony. And my friend, he's not just doing it to provide alcohol at a party. He's doing it to show you what he does, how he transforms life, how he sustains you, how he brings life in abundance, how his spirit comes to overflowing in your life. Oh, I love this because Jesus shows us in, in, in tangible action the, the nature of, of who he is. See, you have to understand, it wasn't his job. It wasn't his responsibility. That's why he says, what's this to me? Because there was a, a, there was a responsible party, and that responsible party was the bridegroom. And the bridegroom's job was to provide his family and the bridegroom. It was their job, and, and Jesus didn't have to. It wasn't his job, but he willfully chose to. Do you understand that? You are responsible for your own sin. You are the one who is absolutely responsible for the condition that you are in as it relates to sin. Some of us could go even a step farther than that and say not only sin, but the condition of our life, the condition of our marriage, the condition of our relationship with our children at work, or the condition of our finances. It is choices that I made that has led me to this place. I'm so glad that Jesus steps in, even though it wasn't his responsibility, it wasn't his creation, it wasn't his job to do it, but he steps in and says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say no to the shame and the condemnation and the guilt in your life, and I'm gonna bring life. I, I, I give you life that is flowing, a river that flows out of your belly. I'm gonna sustain you and bring life and transformation to you. Now, I'm not responsible, but I'm the one who'll be the answer for it. Amen. Every, every transformation begins with the awareness of what is lacking. For some of you today, you, don't, you, don't, you can't put your finger on it exactly, but you know it's there. The reason I say that is because I believe there is this God-shaped place in you that while you may try to fill it with all kinds of things, nothing will ever fit that spot. You were created, I was created in the image of God to worship God, to serve God, to honor God, to bring him glory. And anytime I'm trying to do anything else 
aside from that, trying to fill my life with, with my own agenda, my own dream, my own plan, apart from God. It doesn't work. It leaves me lacking. And Jesus says, I've come to fill you with the Holy Spirit to overabundance and flowing. L- listen, I-, I love this. Let's keep going. Every transformation begins with an awareness of what's lacking. But number two, I'd say this. In, in this instance, you'll see it in John chapter two and verse four. It says, and Jesus said to her, to his mother, Mary, woman, what does this have to do with me? Now, in our culture, um, it probably wouldn't be advisable for you to speak to the significant woman in your life by calling her woman, right? Um, The reality is this, in the culture of the day, and I believe what Jesus is doing is not disrespectful at all. As a matter of fact, it's not at all. I'll tell you why. I think there are a couple of things that Jesus is showing this. Number one, this is about to be the first sign, the first miracle of Jesus here on earth. And so he is now, I believe, when he calls her woman, instead of calling her mother, <laughs> right? What he's actually doing is he is, is he is now separating the way that he deals with Mary because he is now responsible to respond to his father, right? And so all it's simply, I believe what he's saying is this. I'm not saying he's diminishing her role or her importance in his life or his love for her. But I think what he's saying is, I don't do this because people press upon me. I'm not responding to people. I am responding to my heavenly father. And so even as it relates to you, my earthly mother, um, I am no longer responding out of your wishes. If I do this thing, I'm going to do it because my heavenly father tells me to do it. Because Jesus said, the only things that I do, I do because I hear my father. I see my father doing, I do. He's at work and so I'm at work. Okay, so understand, this is, this, is, this is not a moment of disrespect. It is a shifting in the relationship. Because from this point on, you understand. And this is why Jesus says what he says. This is not really any of our business, because it, truthfully, it wasn't. But Mary, <laughs> being a good Jewish mama, she's like, oh, I'm going to make it your business, right? And she brings him. She in, oh, this is so powerful. She invites him into the scenario. Oh, some of you, if you would just invite Jesus into your mess, if you would just invite Jesus and give him a chance. You're so busy trying to do it all on your own, trying to figure it out, and it's leaving you lacking and filled with shame and guilt. Let me just say this to you about shame. Um, There's a difference between shame and guilt. Some people use it interchangeably. They're not the same thing. Guilt is the sense of, of doing something wrong. Everybody in this room is guilty. Every person is guilty. If you've ever broken any of the law of God, if you've stolen, if you've lied, if you've, if you've cheated, if you've, you know, whatever it is that you've done, every one of us have broken. So therefore, every person sitting in this room with the sound of my voice, every campus, every location, you are guilty. But there's a difference between guilt, what I did, and shame, because shame is about who I am becoming. It's the difference between this. I, I, I lied, and I am a liar. You see the difference? One is shame-based. It becomes an identity. It becomes who you are. It becomes this title. And when Jesus steps in and breaks the shame, I'm not saying that we suddenly become not guilty because we are guilty, but he doesn't call us to live in condemnation and shame and guilt. Those aren't the, the, the tools that Jesus uses. It is his kindness that draws us to a place of repentance, Scripture teaches us. So he says no to shame. Why? Because what he's doing is restoring us to relationship. His identity that he's spoken over us is still intact even if we've been guilty but here's what i want you to see jesus says to her this is not any of our business and then says my hour has not yet come this is so interesting here's why jesus i believe says this because jesus in this moment willfully sets in motion his own death here's what he's saying He looks at his mother, who obviously doesn't understand the full dynamic of what's about to happen. And here's what he says. Woman, what is this to us? If if I do this, it's it's because my father tells me. 
it's really not any of my business. If I step in, it's going to be because he leads me to do this. But also, please understand, my hour has not yet come. What is the hour he's talking about? What he's literally saying is this. If I do this miracle, there is no turning back. If I do this miracle, I am setting in motion the events that will ultimately lead to me on a cross. If I do this. Now, some would say, well, was Jesus reluctant? Well, let me just say this to you. (laughs) He was human. God in man. And so there was a a flesh just like you and I that we battle with. And there's a a part of him's like, I don't know that I want to face the humiliation and the abandonment. I don't know that I want to face the torture. I don't know know that I want to be alone. I don't know that I want to feel the full wrath of God and the weight of sin upon me and the separation from my father. In his humanness, there was absolutely a resistance. We see it again in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, if there's any other way, Father, if there's any other way for us to do this, let's, let's do it a different way. But nonetheless, your will, not mine. What it says to me is no matter how far we struggle in the flesh, the reality is this, God gives us the grace in the flesh to do what he's called us to do. And so as we look at the scripture, what you see is this, this moment sets in motion. If it, it sort of lights the fuse that will end up with Jesus upon the cross. But what is this hour he's talking about? Because I don't think it's just a death on the cross. No, no, no. It is the hour in which Jesus restores all of mankind to rightful relationship through redeeming him from the the authority of the enemy and places them as sons and daughters in his kingdom. Now, what, what do I mean? Well, watch this for a second. Think about this. Because what John does is gives us, I believe, if you go back to John 1, how does he start John 1? In the beginning was the word. He he mimics the the creation account in John chapter one, does he not? That's the genealogy he starts with, in the beginning. So he starts at the very beginning, before everything that we know, there was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with. So there's already this picture of a creation account. Now watch this. If you go back to uh, John chapter two and verse one, I want you to listen. On the third day, I believe initially what John is addressing in hindsight is the reality of the third day resurrection. Now it's interesting, the resurrection will ultimately give, give way to what? The marriage supper of the lamb. <laughs> okay, y'all aren't getting this. Put it back up there. On the third day, there was a wedding in Canaan. What he's literally saying is this, because of this third day, there's gonna be a wedding. What's the third day? It's the resurrection. Because the resurrection You and I as believers one day will celebrate the marriage supper of the lamb where Jesus is the bridegroom and his church is the bride, amen. And so understand that Jesus, it wasn't his job to supply the wine, but he stepped in the place in this first miracle of the bridegroom and provided the wine that wasn't his job or his responsibility, but he took upon himself that responsibility and provided what the party needed. Are you seeing it? So here's what I want you to see. Chapter two, verse one begins and says, on the third day, if you were to translate this out, what it literally says is this, and three days later. So this is a little different because because it does talk about the third day, but he's not, this is not the third day. This is three days later after the last event. If you go back and study this out, what you'll see is on, on the narrative of of Jesus and the beginning of John, day one, he was with John the Baptist and and day two, he was with John the Baptist in terms of um, this whole arrangement as it's it's lined out in John. I realize there's other things that happen, but this is the way John is drawing this story under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Day one and two, um, he is with John the Baptist. Day three, he is with his disciples, calling his disciples. And then it says, and three days later, which means it's the sixth day, remember the creation account, what happens on the sixth day? To me, like turn into Genesis. What happens on the sixth day? Creation of mankind, the, the crowning moment of God's creation, man and woman. What happens on the sixth day? There's a wedding. There's a marriage. What he is talking about, why, why is that important? Because what he is saying is this. My hour, what, what happened with that marriage? It fell apart. Sin entered the story. Uh, the, the, all the death, sin and shame and the brokenness and the perversion that we live in this world and the, and the struggle that we have in this world that causes us to question so much, it all began out of the, the formation of that marriage, right? 
And, and, and so what needed to happen? Jesus then, who was the word, wasn't the plan B. God knew what would happen, and he provided a solution in Jesus who would become a bridegroom, who would step in and, and, and bring his bride. You, you see this picture that what happened is Jesus says, I'm going to restore what was done in the first wedding at the second wedding in Cana. I'm going to restore what was done. Some of y'all ain't getting this. Holy Spirit, help us. I'm going to restore what was done, what was broken up front. I'm going to make it right again here. The Messiah is here. He's here to restore and to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. He's here to restore and give you life instead of death. Are y'all seeing this? John writes this in such a way to help us understand that he willfully sets in motion his death. The fall of man is the shame that separates them from God. And Jesus' hour is the hour in which he will go to the cross, not literally, but figuratively. He will go to the cross. He will be buried in a borrowed tomb. He will be resurrected and he will restore man to his rightful place in relationship with God. He will do everything you need to have done so that you can be made right with God. Jesus says, if I do this, I can't undo it. And so we will lead into my hour and forgiveness. It's interesting. Think about it this way. Um, Have you ever had somebody who maybe broke something of yours? Um, maybe lost something of yours, or maybe they, they dinged your car, they, they took your car out, they, bothered it, they borrowed it, it, it came back with a, a scratch or a ding. Anybody with that? Like, like, don't point fingers, but like, okay, just like, I'm so mad, right? We've all had that happen. Um, if you got kids, that's happened, right? Um, what happened? I don't know. It just jumped out in the road, dad. I, I don't know. I'm like, fence posts don't jump out in roads, son. But here's the thing. When those things have happened to us, and, and you know, I'm not talking about massive things. But I'm just like, they're just things, and could be massive things. But they say, oh, I'm so sorry. They're repentant. They're contrite. And you just say to them, oh, it's, it, don't worry about it. Right? You, you, you do that, right? <laughs> Maybe I should preach on forgiveness next week. Um, <laughs> We're going to take a pause and talk about forgiveness with Zion City because they're struggling. Um, no, that's typically kind of what we do. I mean, you know, it's like, we, I can't, you know, maybe you need to be responsible. But, but by and large, they, they broke something. They, they did something. They lost something. You know, it's okay. It's, it's all right. But here's the reality. Anytime that, that forgiveness is issued, somebody still has to pay. Because if your car is wrecked, I mean, you're still going to have to pay to get it fixed if you want it fixed. You're, you're gonna, if something is broken, you're, you're going to have to, that lamp, that, 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 you know, that plate, you have to go pay to restore it. If, if someone loses something and, you know, and it's value, oh, I'm sorry, I lost it, I lost the, the, the check. You, you still have to pay. You understand with Jesus, when he says, I'm bringing forgiveness, somebody still has to pay for it. It doesn't just go away. And so when Jesus says, I am willfully setting in motion, my hour has not yet come. If I do this, I am setting in motion a, a forgiveness for people and a, and a, for, and a rest, restoring of mankind, but I'm still going to have to pay for it. Do you, do you understand? That, that, just, just listen real quick. That's the struggle that I have with people who reject Jesus. I'm like, he still, he paid for your ability to reject him even. He's not against you trying to get something from you. He's already paid for it. Whatever it is, whatever it is. But I just don't believe. Yeah, and I paid for your disbelief. Well, I just think it's all, you know, that I'm so mad at God. And he paid for your ability to rebel in disbelief. He already paid for it. You see... When, in, when forgiveness enters and Jesus sets in motion, he knew I will pay for the sin of every person. I love this. How do we interpret this for our lives? Um, Jesus willfully now sets in motion his death that brings forgiveness. But in verse five, it's, it's interesting because his mother now says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. 
I, I love this because um, Mary, <clears throat> this is so interesting because Mary had no idea what Jesus could do or not do. You know what I mean? I, I mean, there, there's no indication that Jesus, this is his first miracle. His first public miracle. I, I don't know if Jesus, you know, was at the swimming pool with the other kids and Mary's like, Jesus, in the water, not on the water. Right? I don't know if that was happening, but <laughs> I don't know. Probably not. But she really doesn't know the full capacity of his power. She doesn't know what Jesus can do. Now, what she does know about Jesus is I know how he was conceived and I know the experiences I've had with his birth and angels and shepherds and wise men. I've seen the provision of God. I've heard the voice of God. And, and so while she doesn't know his capacity of power, she does have a history with Jesus to know he is more than natural. He is supernatural. And so when she looks at the servants and says, hey, whatever he says to do, just do it. There is something of a faith that has, see, you assume that, oh, Mary just knew. Well, well she knew some things, but she didn't know everything. And there was a moment where she had to release a faith. There, there was a faith-filled moment where she looked at those servants and says, hey, whatever he says, I don't care if he says stand on your head, whatever he says to do, you do it. Why? Because that faith led to a boldness that then led to an action of called for obedience. Can, can I tell you this is what I, what I see? He, she says to him, do whatever he says. And I would say to you, if you want to know the keys to having supernatural miracles in and through your life, it is simply this, do what he says. Do what he says. Now, that seems very broad and very general, but I will tell you the principle is this. All throughout scripture, as you read the promises of God, you see a lot of people love to quote the promises, but what they miss often is the, the pre-existing commands and expectation that God asks of his people. He says, if you will humble yourself and seek my face and pray, then I will hear from, there are so many if then statements throughout scripture. And we love to go, oh, God's gonna do it and God's gonna bless, and yes, he will. But what he does, what I would say to you is do what he tells you and you'll see what he does. There are far too many people who don't want to do what he tells us. And here's why this is so important, because obedience is the key to a new season. And obedience is the key to maturity. And obedience is the key to the supernatural activity of God in your life. It's obedience, friend. It's action that is connected to faith and boldness and obedience. Whatever he tells you to do, we're talking about a summer of miracles. I'm going to tell you the, the real reality is God may ask you to do some things. He may ask you to pray. He may ask you to go to an altar. He may ask you to fast. He may ask you to do some things and you go, well, how is that going to help? And I'm going to tell you, listen, what, just like Mary said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Do what he says. Why is that? I love this. Whatever he says to do. And so, of course, Jesus then looks at the, at the, at the servants and says, go fill the water pots. I, I find this interesting because Jesus says, fill the, fill the jars with water. And the Bible says, and they filled them up to the brim. <laughs> do you understand the servants who now have been directed to do something? Jesus says, hey, go fill the water pots with water. They could have argued. What is water going to do? We, we need wine, not water, man. What's the matter with you? Oh, I, I love when the, the rational humanistic mind gets involved with God. Don't you? you? You need to explain to God the laws of physics. You need to explain to God the laws of nature. God, God I don't think you understand. We don't need water. We need wine. Water, water's not going to help us in this moment, right? We need wine. So if you'd like to jot on down to the 7-Eleven and get us some wine, that would be fantastic. There's a lot of people, they live their lives. That's why you never see the supernatural. I'm going to say that again. There's a lot of you, that's the way you live your lives. That's why you never see the supernatural. And you just doubt anybody who says they do. But I'm going to tell you, a life of miracles is a life that is hard fought and hard won. And listen, Jesus didn't do it because of their action, but their action, it was the key to open the door to the supernatural that Jesus would pour out. The miracle was Jesus, not the servants, but the servants had a part to play of obedience that released the supernatural into the environment. 
Oh, I'm, I'm preaching better than y'all are letting on today. I'm just telling you. You can sit around and doubt it, or you could just be obedient. I remember years ago, um, I had a, a, a family member and a friend, family member, close, close family member, um, that we had run a business. I've shared this. We shared a business together. Um, when I moved to Arizona, uh, I... Uh, I, we, we shut the business down just because it wasn't feasible to continue with it. And there was some money of mine that was still left in the account and, and this family member needed it and so took it, right? And it was rightfully mine and he took it. And man, I was, I found myself brewing and stewing on this. You ever been there? Not you, right? You're like, nope. <laughs> I was so angry, righteously indignant. Like, this is not right. I wrote, I wrote him, you know, I called him, I texted him. We had all kinds of, didn't, never got anywhere. And I found myself starting to get really angry about it. And it wasn't that, wasn't that huge amount of money. It wasn't like it was life-changing, but it was principled. I'm a pretty principled guy. And so I was like, this is not right, right? God, this is not right. And, um, and so I was angry. And so I was like, man, I'm gonna stay after this thing. Until all of a sudden, one day I came to a, a prayer meeting and the Holy Spirit just said, hey, I need you to do something. I was like, what's that? He said, I need you to let it go. And I said, wait, 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 okay. So you're clapping, stop clapping. It's not the moment to clap. That's not the good part of the story. I was ticked. Like, I'm so glad God told you that. I'm like, I wasn't. I was like, because here's the truth. What I needed that money for was I just moved to Arizona and I needed to buy a house and I needed down payment for my house. So we had attachments. Now watch this. It, it was, it was going to be for my house, for my kids and my wife. Y'all follow. So it wasn't just like, oh, I need fun money to go, you know, whatever. No, no, I'm like, Lord, I have plans for this. Don't you understand? He says, I need you to forgive. And here's what I've learned about the Lord. When he asks me to do something so clear and so simple, I don't have to complicate it by arguing with him. And so I said, okay. So I, I literally wrote an email to this person. I said, hey, I just want you to know, I forgive it. No, I don't forgive the act. I forgive the act and I forgive the debt. Don't worry about it. Now let it go. Now the beauty of what happened to me was I immediately felt the lift of all of this anger and this lift, because I'm like, okay, Lord, I'll just trust you. It's interesting. Um, this is, <laughs> it's an interesting turn of how this works. Uh, about, about nine, 10 years later, um, I, was, I was buying land that I wanted to build my house on, been planning this, saving for it for a decade, preparing for it. And, um, uh, I, started, I started to build this house. Well, there came a piece of property next to my house that came up for sale. And this same family member, um, and because I had forgiven it, we were all restored. It was good. So they had come out to visit me. And this family member got excited about the land next to me and said, hey, I'll just buy that land. And then I'll build a place where, you know, I could come for the summers or family. I was like, oh, that's great. That's awesome. I don't, you can buy it, whatever you want to. And so he did because the Lord had blessed him through the years. And so he just bought it, paid cash for it. And so I thought, okay, well, that's, that's great. Until about three months later, he calls me and says this, hey, um, you know that land next to your house? I said, yeah. And we had, by this time we had, we were in the process of starting building our house. Um, he said, hey, that land next to you. He said, you know, I got to think about it. Um, I'm not gonna build anything. You can just have it. See, everybody like, ooh. You know what that's connected to? 10 years of obedience. You thought it was just like, oh, God always gives you stuff. When you obey. You following me? Because you didn't have it. Here's what was, here was, here's what was funny about it. This was, this was 10 years later, Right? Here's what's funny about it. That piece of land was worth 10 times what he took. 
What if I didn't obey? It's interesting. Obedience, do whatever he says. I'm just, I'm talking to somebody. If he tells you to forgive, forgive. I'm not saying, forgiveness doesn't mean we have to be best buddies. And forgiveness doesn't mean there doesn't need to be accountability. In this situation, the Lord just said to me, just forgive it. I will take care of you. I got you, Lord. You hear what I'm saying? When the Lord tells you to do something, it's not because he's trying to take something from you. He's trying to get something to you. And so you have to fall so deeply in love and trusting of him to go, Lord, I know who you are and how you take care of your kids. I never in a million years thought that would happen. But I am so glad that I obeyed. You see, obedience is a key that opens new doors. The, 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 the servants, they could have argued, but they filled it. And the Bible says they filled it to the brim. What this indicates is, for those of you who are skeptics, um, nothing else could have been added to this water to make it because it was very common for them to dilute wine. And so if they'd only filled it halfway full, they could have, you know, dumped the wine in, weakened it, all those sorts of things. But the reality is it was to the brim. There was no room for any, watch this. What if you put yourself in a position where there's no room for anything but a supernatural response? <laughs> I love the golf clap. You're like, I don't know about that. I need a little space to control this thing faster because you can't trust God. I know you're sincere and you're clapping, but, but here's the reality. What happens when you get to the place where you got, I got nothing but, I got no room for anything but supernatural now. And the beauty of that is Jesus proves in that moment is when his supernatural works the best. Last thing I'd say is this, we'll close it up. Verse 9 and 10, you know what happens. They fill the water. Jesus says, take it to the master. They went to the master of the feast, and, 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 and they took it to him. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now it became, that had become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants had drawn the water new, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first, the Bible says, of his signs Jesus did at Cana and Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed him. I love this because we often get confused about glory. We take one instance of God's glory in a narrative of Moses and we think it's got to look like this. There's got to be angels. There's got to be this. There's got to be that. And the reality is there's none of that in this narrative. But yet it's still the glory of Jesus. The glory of God shows up. Here's my final thought. Um, what I think Jesus is showing us is you can have the best, his best, now. You can have his best now. Well, why do I say that? Because here's what I would say to you. Oftentimes, the thing that you are pursuing that will run out, that will leave you lacking, what the world is offering you as an answer, as its best, starts out good, but it also, it always becomes lesser. It starts out great, and then it diminishes in your life. The thing that you had to have, now you, you don't have to have. The thing that you wanted so deep, so dearly, and you sacrificed for, and then you get it. After only a, a, a small amount of time, it, it, it sort of becomes lackluster. It, it's a picture. It's what the, 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 the master of ceremony says. We usually start out with the good stuff, and then we move to the not-so-good stuff. Because people, once they get the good stuff, they, they, they get a little bit, um, they're indulged a little bit. And so now we can lessen the quality, and that is the approach of the world. We'll sell you the best, knowing that it will lessen in value. But what Jesus offers is the best now. What he offers is in the midst of your lack, in the midst of your brokenness, he says, I have the best and it's better than what you've had before. I believe that God has the best plan for your life. I believe he has the best plan for your eternity. I believe he has the best plan for your marriage. Listen to me. I believe he has the best plan for your sexuality. I believe he has the best plan for your finances. I believe he has the best plan for your health. I believe he has the best plan for your kids. I believe he has the best plan. 
He has a more excellent wine. He has a better plan than you can come up with or the world can offer you on your own. He says you can have the best now that comes from a relationship with him and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life. Listen to what Psalms 34 says. It says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Jesus says in John 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. You can have the best. You don't have to settle for less than God's best in your life. You don't have to live a subpar existence. I'm not saying the Christian life is perfect without struggles, but I'm going to tell you something I know. It is the best. It is the best because it's God's best. John gives us the first of 35 recorded miracles throughout the gospels as the first of his signs that Jesus did in Canaan and Galilee where he manifested his glory, his goodness. And his disciples believed him. What did they believe? I think it's the same for us today. We can believe that Jesus has has the power over all things. You can believe that Jesus has the power over all things, all situations. We can believe that he's more than just a miracle worker, more than just a good teacher, more than just a a lover of those who are broken and downhearted and cast down. We can believe that Jesus is God. And because he is God, he has power over all things. We can also believe as the disciples became to believe that Jesus actually loves you. But not only does he just love you, he cares about your needs. Jesus starts with a very practical miracle that really doesn't seem to be all that important in the scope of eternity, but yet he does it to establish himself as the Messiah in people's minds, but also he does it because he cares about the needs of people. Can I tell you, if you had any understanding of a God who would die for you, pay for the sin, pay for the ability to forgive you and care for your needs, amazing to consider. It tells us that we can believe that Jesus will transform us. Friend, I got to tell you, it's not that he will just give you a better life. He'll transform you. He will change you from the inside. He won't just deal with the guilt and the shame and the repercussions of sin. He'll deal with the very power of sin in your life the control, the addiction, the brokenness. He'll deal with the very root of it, not just the the outcomes in your life. It's not just here to give you a better life. He's here to give you an abundant life. (laughs) He's not just here to make your life a little bit more bearable that you can get through and make it to next Sunday or make it to the prayer. No, no, no. He's come to transform you from water to wine, from death to life, from, from the law to grace. He's come to transform you into a, a, from, a, from a slave to a son. He's come to transform you. And all it takes is obedience, surrender. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, I thank you for your word today. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to hearts right now as only you can. I pray today that there would be an awareness of the distance from God. Lord, that there'd be an awareness of your love and your kindness that brings us to a place of repentance. Lord, there'd be an awareness of your ability to transform, that you offer life and life abundant to those who would follow you. I pray for faith to fill the rooms, to fill every campus right now. Speak to hearts. If you're sitting here today, I simply want to ask you this. You say, you know what, Pastor? I I need Jesus. 
I, I want to surrender my life to him. I want to make him Lord of my life. I, he offers me forgiveness that I don't deserve. He, he takes responsibility and carries the wrath of God and sin that really belong to me. And he gives me life, abundant life. Today, I need that forgiveness. I, I need, I want to be restored in my relationship. I want to be right with God. Today, if that's you with your heads bowed and your eyes closed and nobody moving around just to honor this moment, if that's you and you say, that's me, Pastor. The Holy Spirit is speaking to me. He's talking to me today. He's breaking off the shame. And Jesus has come to deal with the guilt. If that's you today and you say, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I believe he died for me. I believe he paid for my sins. I believe that he rose again. I want to surrender my life to him, to invite him in to be my Lord and Savior. If that's you today, would you just lift your hand and say, pray for me. Pray for me. Come on, that's it. Yeah. Pray for me. Pray for me. I believe Jesus is who he said he is. I want to surrender my life. Yeah, there's hands all over this place. Come on, every campus. doesn't matter if I'm in the room. The Holy Spirit's in the room right now. You surrender. Respond to him. Yes, I, I want my relationship.